And next up, we have uh, Matt Hutchings from CQC. So if Matt is ready, if Natalia, you can stop sharing your screen. If Matt is ready, then he can start sharing his. Hello. I think we're ready for you to start sharing, Matt. Thanks. Thank you. Where is it? I'm going to have to rejoin. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, of course, I've, everyone's aware we need to be a bit patient during these virtual conferences, I'm sure. Um, so hopefully Matt can be back very shortly with his uh, talk. I see Matt's slides. Uh, okay. Matt, uh, Sorry, and I can, Matt. I can hear you as well. So uh, yeah, that's great. Okay. You can hear me and see the stuff. Good. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I, I've been listening in and, and hearing some really interesting stuff that's very technical. So uh, this, this particular talk is going to be much more of a kind of high level <laughs> uh, understanding of, of just an introduction to kind of what we're doing in the quantum space. Um, but I'm very happy to field more technical questions um, along the way or, or kind of at the end of this and talk offline. So uh, let's just get into it. So yeah, who we are, I always think to start preferencing. Uh, what we're going to talk about. So, so we're, we're kind of a, a, a unique um, startup slash spin out. So we, we came from a company called Hypris, uh, which in the early 80s, but themselves spun out of IBM. Um, and they, Hypris has been known as the world leader of superconducting kind of technologies for a number of years. Um, and, and with that, we've kind of inherited um, kind of unique perspective on building systems. So, so Hypris and now the kind of company as we formed uh, we've kind of delivered, you know, full cryogenic uh, kind of systems surrounding superconducting systems. Um, so we're kind of bringing that to this 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 kind of area um, with the focus that we want to kind of make sure that quantum computing is a commercial product, not just a kind of um, academic uh, dream to some extent. Um, so yeah, we're we're coming to this, and we have actually raised a significant amount of capital to to start this journey. Uh, but I won't kind of bore you with the details, but. Um, some something to talk about that we, we're actually um, quite a unique company and we've started out in three locations at one time. Uh, so for a small company of 15, we're, we're spread across three, three kind of countries, uh, which is a unique challenge and an interesting one. Um, but yeah, so, so we, are, we are kind of do doing this because we see quantum computing as a, as a real global challenge. Um, and and there's, there's you know, unique talent spread all over the world and we want to be able to access and work with that talent. Uh, so we've kind of strategically aligned ourselves with a number of different areas and, and companies within this space. Um, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. Um, you've probably heard this a lot already, so I'm not going to labor it again, but why, why people care about quantum computers compared to um, classical computers. Um, but I just want to give our kind of perspective of this. Um, so essentially, you know, the way class computers work today is they're binary. So, you know, we see the world through this kind of zeros and ones uh, vision, uh, which is great. I and mean, we have a lot of mathematical laws that can allow this, but, but you know, ultimately, um, you know, the world itself is, is quantum mechanical in nature. So it doesn't, it doesn't conform to these zeros and ones that we forced uh, computing to kind of the road road to be traveled. So, so, you know, Feynman very famously said that it, you know, if the world is, if the world is quantum mechanical, then you need a, a quantum system that you can control to understand that world better. Uh, so that's the real vision for why I personally got into this kind of business that, you know, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we building quantum computers? And it's, it's really to understand the world better uh, and start to simulate it. And that's kind of the core focus of what we want to do. We want to simulate uh, nature better. Um, but then I also like to talk about the kind of journey from, from how, how classical computers got to where they are today. Cause you know, everyone forgets that, you know, we've got these wonderful iPads and, and phones that have all the power in the world, but um, they started out looking a lot like this. 
uh, which is a room filling computer uh, with lots of wires and, and even operators that had to go in and plug in individual wires. Um, and we like to talk about this because, because we see a very similar synergy between the way classical computers were built to the way quantum computers are built today. Um, so this is kind of the state of the art quantum computer um, in superconducting uh, computing at least. There's a number of different platforms that you've probably heard about a lot. Uh, but this is the superconducting, kind of most powerful superconducting computer um, by definitions of awkward ones, but we won't get into that. But it, it's a reasonably powerful computer. Um, but you can see it kind of has this similar similar vein to it, that it's, um, it's a large computer with lots of wires and lots of complex overhead. Um, and, and this is because, you know, essentially quantum computing is a very difficult system, but, but this is also taking a very prototype system and scaling it up to the biggest we can physically make. Um, so if you think back to that kind of early classical computer to the, this early quantum computer, we see that, you know, we need to solve kind of similar challenges to make this quantum computer a kind of commercial product, something that's actually going to do something uh, useful. And that's where, where Seek's approach kind of comes in. So we've taken you know, a lot of that, that room temperature electronics, all of that kind of, all those wires and distilled it down into a kind of um, a digital control chip, uh, which is based on SFQ technology. And as I said, I'm happy to, to feel questions on, on what, well, how that works more specifically. Uh, but just to say in this context, what we want to do is integrate um, the classical control architecture that you need for quantum systems into the quantum processor itself. So rather than having the classical world being this room temperature system and the quantum world sitting in these very extreme environments, we want to bring them both together. Um, and that's what this technology does. Um, and and so, so with this technology, we can do some pretty unique things. Um, I mean, the most important one uh, I'll highlight here is that um, by bringing it, by integrating the control with the, with the quantum systems, uh, we can massively reduce the energy dissipation on these systems. And that's critical to kind of scaling a superconducting quantum computer anyway, because, you know, the way those, those what those wires are doing in, in the first photo you saw is bringing in effectively heat external, you know, room temperature noise. Um, so, so by building this integrated system, we can remove a lot of that, um, enabling some scale. Um, but also, you know, by integrating the system, we can dramatically reduce the cost per qubit. And this we see as a critical avenue to actually making, you know, quantum computers viable and useful. Um, it's all well and good to make these, these giant quantum computers, but unless people start buying them, we won't be able to get better ones. And that's what we really want to do here. Um, so we're also taking a kind of different approach to say the big, the IT giants like Google and IBM, where we don't want to build universal quantum computers. We want to be quite focused. Uh, and this is partly built on a strategy from NVIDIA that, you know, they, they first off didn't want to um, build, you know, classical computers. They wanted to port a single game to a, from a console to a PC. Um, and then in doing so, they were able to enter the market. And now, you know, everyone's got a graphics card in their computer. And they're thanks to, well, thanks to NVIDIA. So we want to do the same for quantum computing. That how do we get quantum computing into the hands of people that really care about it and want to use it? Um, and that's by taking this application specific approach. So we want to partner closely with end users uh, in some of the industries I'll talk about in a minute uh, to say, what are you doing today with classical computing that you, were, you can't, that does, where classical computing doesn't really help as it should? And how can we build a system that supports that specifically? Um, so that's kind of one of our strategies, um, this, this, this application specific. And the reason we're doing that is because at least in the next few years, quantum computers aren't going to be very big and powerful. They're going to be quite limited. Um, and we need to squeeze out every last bit of, of power from the very limited quantum resources we have. So we want to, we want to really, you know, design and from the ground up partner these, these quantum, these hard, this limited quantum hardware with an end use case. So we can really optimize that whole process. Um, but we also know that essentially, you know, to make the most of quantum resources, and this will be true forever, that we need still very powerful classical computers to support that. Um, so classical computers themselves are needed for many of the aspects of a, of a quantum computing operation. So the control, uh, all of the overhead is classical. We ourselves are classical beings, so we want to interact with something that we're familiar with. So you're gonna to need to build these hybrid systems. Um, so what we really wanna do is build a truly hybrid system where you know, we want to optimize the classical logic for the quantum logic. So we have this kind of unique 
um, SFQ processor that's that's by it's a, it's a classical processor, uh, but because it works in a superconducting way, um, it can operate at tens to to well, tens to hundreds of gigahertz. Um, so it's significantly faster than the, the kind of classical computers that exist today. Um, and and though it, it has some limitations, the point of it is that in superconducting quantum systems anyway. Um, the, the qubits themselves are very, you know, they're very fast. They operate in gigahertz regimes. So in order to actually correct errors or, or understand the state of those qubits, you need to be operating very fast. So the classical logic we have today just won't, just doesn't keep up with the quantum logic that we have of tomorrow. So we need a very fast, powerful computer to do that. And that's what we're, we're developing. Um, so we see this is, this is the kind of like the commercial grade quantum computer of the future. So um, rather than having all of the all of the classical outside of the fridge and all of the quantum inside, we're kind of building a lot of that classical support into the fridge. Um, so we have this kind of digital interface layer, which turns the very delicate quantum state into a classical binary output as quickly as physically possible. And that's critical because, as I said, these these quantum states are very delicate. They need to be, you know, turned into classical stable logic as quickly as possible. So if you have to go outside of the fridge to, to, to understand the state of your qubit, you, you're causing this latency issue that's, that's actually critical in, in scaling up system. Um, but then we can also build these, this classical hybrid logic that can support applications um, and error correction and things like that. So this is the kind of full system. Um, but the reason we're really doing this is because, um, you know, if you look back to that, that early kind of classical era again, um, you see, how do we go from those room filling rooms to the class, the laptops we have today? And it was partly realizing along the journey that, that if you, if every time you add a bit, you have to add a wire to that bit to control it, you're never going to build a big system. And this was essentially coined by Bell Labs in the, in the eighties as rents rule. I don't know, this, the tyranny of numbers. It was that every single time you had to add a new bit, you had a new wire and it was going to become just a big, big mess. Um, so then this got distilled into what's called rents rule. Um, and then, and then Fairchild that became Intel, um, having recognized this realized that what they needed to do was integrate a lot of the control with the, with the bits themselves and in doing so massively reduced the wire count. Um, and this is what we want to do with the quantum world. We want to say massively reduce the number of overhead wires you need to actually physically control quantum bits. Um, and so we, if you compare our technology with the, the best, which is Google, um, you can essentially say that you see that every single time Google adds a, a qubit, they add a wire, which is great for getting up to, you know, 50 odd qubits, but, but you're never really going to be able to get to thousands or millions because, you know, no one can imagine a fridge with millions and millions of wires. It's feasibly potentially possible, but whether that will be, you know, a, an achievable product is another matter. So what we want to do is build this integrated circuit and by definition in doing so, we massively reduce the, the wire, the number of wires in and out of the fridge. And that is our, in our mind critical to both making it cost effective um, and scalable. So that just some high level things. I mean, most importantly, I think is the heat reduction and the latency. Um, so in, in lots of our conversations with, with end users and actually application developers, uh, we learn a lot about how the application wants to manipulate the quantum system. And if you have to wait a long time to understand your quantum system um, by adding lots of latency, then you're not really going to get the best answer. So, so we want to improve those metrics. But as a company, what we most care about is bringing down the cost per qubit. Um, because today, um, building kind of a Google quantum system costs about $40,000 a qubit. Um, so if you just scale that up to, to a million qubits, um, you not many people on the planet are going to buy such a system for that level of money. So, so we really need to bring down the cost per qubit to make it a viable product. And more importantly, then to get it useful and get it into the market and get, get people using them, which is the whole point of this. Um, and then to that note, you know, who are we caring about that we think wants to build a, wants to use a quantum computer? Um, so there's that kind of the very common um, areas of, of, of verticals of customers that would be interested in quantum computing for various reasons. Um, so I think the most interesting one is chemistry, uh, because that links to that first brief of, of in understanding nature, we want a quantum computer and chemi the chemists of the world, they, use, they do a lot of simulations of nature. 
um, and quite big nature and getting bigger nature. Um, and they're, 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 they're really where classical computers not delivering on, on the kind of answers that they want. Um, and we've actually partnered with a company, Merck, um, is one of the largest in this area, specifically with that, that in mind. So we want to say, how are we going to build our quantum system to meet your specific end goals? Um, so that's a really exciting kind of collaboration, which I'm happy to talk about more. Uh, but we're also, as a company, we're not trying to um, be full stack, as they call it, you know, build the full system. We just want to build our hardware. Um, so we're partnered with uh, a lot of algorithm developers and some very, very specific ones uh, in order to actually build out the full application layer. So our strategy is to just partner with the best uh, in, in different areas and, and work on that. So one, one I'd like to highlight, he was, he was invited on Monday, um, is River Lane and, and Steve Bradley, the, uh, the CEO of, of, of River Lane. So we're working really closely with River Lane um, on that Merck problem. Uh, so how you can build a quantum chemistry app for quantum computers. Um, so yeah, they're a really smart team and we're really excited to be working with them. So yeah, that's, that's about it for, for me. Um, I'm very happy to, yeah, to take, take any more questions on, on the kind of hard technical stuff. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm clapping again on, uh, behalf of myself and also, uh, well over 150 people who've been viewing this talk. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so if it's okay, I think I'm going to take up your offer for a, a more technical discussion. Yeah. Sure. Um, maybe I can, uh, kick off the first question. So um, I saw on a slide that you had uh, processor speeds of 10 to 40 gigahertz. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, like, firstly, like how? Because that's how? very impressive. And also, um, what can those processors do? What logical processing tasks are they able to achieve? Yeah, sure. So, so this is, this is um, the processor technology is, is based on uh, something called rapid single flux quantum. So, so whereas today's classical computers use transistors to do their logic, uh, which is just a voltage, you know, a voltage transition and a gate, essentially. Uh, in our case, our on-off is the existence or the lack of a flux quanta that exists within a squid loop. So squid is a superconducting quantum interference device um, where if you apply a voltage across it, you get a flux slip. Um, and if you have a, a train of them, then you can create something called, uh, you know, a, a single flux quantum chain. So you just get this flux slip that moves around. Um, and, and if you actually cleverly put that circuit together, you can create a flip flop, which essentially says, I'm either going to be a, give you a, 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 a zero, you know, a flux or not. And, and we can then build a whole logic class about, um, the, the existence or lack of a flux quanta. Um, and so zero is, is no flux quanta, one is there is a flux quanta. Um, and, in do, and the reason we can do it so fast is because uh, we can work at the, the theoretical maximum speed of which a squid could work, which is on the order of 700 gigahertz. Um, so how quickly can you flip a bit in our case is, is about on the order of hundreds of gigahertz. Um, of course, it gets a lot more complicated when you start routing fluxes around and things like that. So we've stably got 10 gigahertz and we're moving towards 40 gigahertz in a kind of, uh, it's a simple adder at this stage. So it takes, takes numbers and adds more. Um, okay, that's cool. So, yeah. Um, so what, temp what temperature do you need to work out for those kind of superconducting circuits? It can work anywhere from three Kelvin down. So it's based on Niobium right. technology. Um, okay. so, so it's kind of this, this interesting world where, um, you know, no one wanted to get cold in classical logic because it was annoying um, and it was expensive. Uh, but now we've got quantum logic, which one of the main candidates has to be cold. We, we're taking advantage of that by saying, well, we're already cold. Let's just, let's just build a bigger system down there. Uh, so that's kind of what we're doing. So we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that we can be miller Kelvin operation and building the computer there rather than taking a, a clap, a take, trying to take a laptop computer and make it cold. Okay. So um, Joel Tasker asks, are you quantum computing platform agnostic? Um, is Seek conscious of the similar demands uh, like cryo temperatures and latencies for integrated photonic quantum computing? Yeah, so we, the the hard the platform agnostic aspect is a bit. It's an, it's a there's many answers. <laughs> so sure. uh, there's a strategy answer and there's a technology answer. And the technology answer is that that we could be compatible with 
um, superconducting qubits, silicon qubits, and uh, iron trap qubits. We have certain technology that could be compatible with photonic computers, computers mainly in the readout, so we can do single photon detectors and things right. like that. Um, but on a strategy level, we're focused on superconducting qubits because um, that is, it's, as far as our technology goes, it's the most seamless transition. Um, so we can most, e most easily read out and control superconducting qubits. Um, so okay. that's, that's kind of where we're focused. Uh, but we do have, you know, we, the way we do it is we look at, we, we kind of partner with academic groups in the kind of silicon and, and iron trap areas to go, you know, if we did this, could we, could we build a processor? Could we control your architecture? Um, so we're interested, but but mostly focused on superconducting. Okay, thanks. So um, uh, Josh Silverstein asks, uh, do you foresee taking on higher level calculations with your controllers, e.g. error correction or compilation? I guess so, right. error correction to me seems like the most latency demanding task that you could imagine exactly. doing. Exactly. I think that's, that's probably the most important thing we want to be doing. Um, so especially in superconducting systems where um, the error correction overhead is just enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and and so so we re yeah we intend to build our classical architecture purely for supporting error correction, um, and we're actually working with one qubit on that specific goal. So we're, one qubit are kind of experts in in building um, decoders for for quantum for superconducting system well, for any quantum computer um, de error correction decoders. Um, so we're working with them to say okay how do we take our SFQ RSFQ logic and and root everything in a way that that does error correction um so so in error correction it's it's kind of interesting because you just want you want brute force speed in superconducting systems um yeah. because they are like i said they they deco here so quickly um that you have to you're always fighting against against that 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 decoherence um so so in iron trap systems, it's interesting because they, they operate, they have longer coherence, they operate more slowly. So conventional logic can actually help them. Uh, but in superconducting yep. logic, superconducting quantum systems, because of the sheer speed they operate at, classical logic is not able, it's very, it's very demanding on classical logic to do error correction. So yeah, there's a long way of saying, yes, we, that's what we're pretty much focused on. Okay, so if it's okay, I might ask another question myself. So um, what I'd be interested to know is, what's the level of complexity that your chips are at? What's sort of like the, your analog of like the transistor count? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, there's two aspects. There's, there's the classical and there's the quantum. So um, in the quantum state, we're just at two qubit level, so it's not particularly advanced, mm -hmm. um, but it's advanced enough to show it works. Um, uh, and we can, we can manipulate quantum states and we can read them out, which is exciting. On the classical level, uh, we're at the stage where we have, you know, an 8-bit processor. Right. So fully cryogenic 8-bit processor clocked at about 10 gigahertz. Okay, and how hard do you think it would be to scale that up to sort of, I don't know, millions or whatever would be required to do some sort of decoder? Well, we're, we're on the path to get that to a, you know, so we want to achieve 64 bits. Obviously, that, that's quite challenging. So we're trying to work with the partners to say, you know, we don't, what if, what can we do with, with more speed and fewer bits? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I, I saw on one of your slides, uh, that you're uh, thinking about Mariana, uh, qubits yes. as well as transform qubits. Um, I mean, I guess at least I don't really know what they're going to look like. And I, I assume most people don't really know what they're going to look like either. So I don't know if you can say anything about how you might target them. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's, there's, you know, that's on there, not, not by my choice, but um, I prefer to think of topologically protected qubits um, okay. with, as a transition towards such a, 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 a qubit like that. But um, so, so in top, I think topological protections of qubits are a better way to talk about it because, you know, you can start to envision superconducting topological qubit, protected qubits, um, which we're starting yes. to see the emergence sure. of already. So I think as a company, we're more focused on that. But of course, we understand that people are building Mariana qubits out of superconducting materials, um, mm -hmm. and and they are requiring voltage pulses to operate, which we are able to do. <laughs> sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Th those are uh, some really great answers, and it was a really great talk. So uh, yeah. Thanks again very much.